in the bandwidth allocation problem we use one variable per path in order to encode a network flow problem as a linear program and we argued that that's not an efficient way to do it so let's look at a more direct way to represent network flows in terms of linear programs so suppose we have an oil network which is shown as given in this directed graph so we have a source vertex s right and we have a target or a sink vertex t and our aim is to ship as much oil as we can from s to t given the pipes that we are given so of course one one uh, property of a flow is that it must flow so i cannot keep any quantity at any intermediate node so anything that enters d must leave d anything that enters d must leave d right so if we try to do this then for instance this green quantity represents one possible flow i sent two units from s to a one from s to b four from s to c and you can check that these are in fact within the capacity because i could have sent 3 3 and 4 and i have sent 2 1 and 4 and i keep going and therefore now at this particular thing i have a total of seven units which flows out of s and seven units which comes into t so i am able to flow seven units from s to t given this network right so we can just verify this locally that this is the flow by checking for instance at d the total quantity flowing in is 2 plus 1 3 that nothing is stored because the total quantity flowing out is again 2 plus 1 3 right so if we can do local checks like this we can satisfy ourselves that this is a valid flow the total amount is 7 but the question is is this the maximum how do we know whether we have achieved the maximum or not so the problem just to phrase it phrase it formally is that we are given a special type of graph okay so it's a directed graph and it has two special nodes a source and a sink the source has no incoming edges and the sink has no outgoing edges okay each edge has a capacity which is a weight associated with it and our aim is to come up with a flow a flow is again a quantity that we will assign each edge and now the flow must satisfy some basic conditions the flow must always be less than the capacity then we have no storage so at every internal node the total amount flowing into the node must be equal to the total amount flowing out okay so this is called conservation of flow we cannot lose anything or generate anything at an intermediate node everything that comes in must go out and finally what we want to do is we want to optimize the total volume of flow and the total volume of flow is the amount of flow which is coming out of here which is also of course the amount of flow which is going there because no flow can be lost okay so we can look at either end but let's just define it to be the total volume of the outgoing flow from the source node okay yeah. so now we have this uh, formulation in mind so we can now set up a linear program for it right what we associate do is we associate as we said one variable for each edge so for instance for the edge for sa we have fsa and then for the edge bd for example we have fbd and then for ce we have fce and so on right so we have 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 i believe edges oh yeah 11 edges and therefore we have 11 variables in this linear program okay now what can we do with these variables one well, first is we can say that each variable is constrained by the capacity of the corresponding edge okay so fba so ba is now this edge it has a capacity of 10 so whatever flow i i finally arrive at from b to a must be less than 10 then the other thing that we can say is that we must have a conservation of flow at each internal node right so for instance if i look at this node d then the incoming flow is ad plus bd and the outgoing flow is dc plus de plus dt right and these two quantities must be equal fad plus fbd must be equal to fdc plus fd plus fdt and finally so these are the constraints right the constraints say that every edge can only carry a flow within its capacity and every internal node there is conservation of flow and finally our objective is to maximize what happens on these three edges fsa plus fsb plus fsc this is our objective function so of course as before we will just invoke a linear programming solver such as simplex on this and get an answer but what we will do now is to understand 
what this actually means. Remember how simplex works. So simplex starts at a vertex in our feasible region and keeps going from one vertex to the next. So as long as it's increasing the flow, okay, it's actually taking an existing flow and adding something to it. And this can actually be interpreted directly in terms of a flow finding algorithm. So there's an algorithm called the Ford Fulkerson algorithm, which actually tries to directly solve a network flow problem by gradually building up an optimum flow. So the algorithm assumes you start with an zero flow and then you choose some path on which there is spare capacity. And then on this path, you augment the flow as much as possible so that that flow path becomes saturated. So now, if you look at the algorithm network on the right, it's very clear that there is a flow possible too. You can send one unit of flow that way, and you can send one unit of flow this way. But the Ford Fulkerson algorithm says take any path which exists and start flowing things to there. So you could, for instance, begin with this path, the one that goes from S to D, and then from D down to E, and then to T. So this flows one unit, but now at this point, this edge is now saturated and this edge is now saturated and of course this edge is in the wrong direction. So I cannot make use of these two capacities to generate the second unit of flow. So it looks like the Ford Fulkerson algorithm reaches a bottleneck if you choose the wrong path to start with. So the solution is to say that even if we have taken a bad path, okay, one of the things we can do is reverse the decision we made earlier. So we want to say that if we are flowing one through this, then we can reduce this flow. Okay, So we can divert this flow back another way. So that's a bit complicated to describe, but one way to solve it is to actually set up an extra edge allowing us to flow things back. Right? So this is what we call the residual graph. So in the residual graph, what we will do is we will actually take the flow that we just constructed and then we will change the capacities. So the forward edge S to D which had capacity 1 and flow 1 now has residual capacity 0. Right? So if we have a regular edge then we replace its, its weight by the actual amount that is still available. So that is the capacity minus the current flow. And in addition we add these new edges, these backward edges okay, which correspond to the flows that we have committed but which we may want to change later on. So we have sent a flow 1 from S to D, but now we can reduce that flow by sending some flow back from D to S. So that's what this is supposed to be. Right? So formally, this is how you construct the residual graph. You take the original graph, then any flow that you have set up in an existing edge, you reduce the capacity of that edge by that flow. And corresponding to that flow, you set up a reverse edge, which allows us later to undo this. So going back to this example, so what we would do is we would first start with this wrong flow and then we will say ah, but then we will build this residual graph and now we will observe that in this residual graph there is a path which goes like this. Right? So we are not talking about the original graph, we are only talking about the residual graph at each stage. So we will build this. Now this will result in a new flow. So this will end up producing a zero here, a new edge back here, similarly a zero here, a new edge back here. Okay. And this one will now become cancelled out because now this path is, this flow, so this is restored to one and this edge will disappear. Okay. And now in this new graph, we will find that there are no edges left because I have zero capacity going from S to D, I have zero capacity going from S to E, so I can't leave any flow from S, so this is my final flow. Okay. So this is the Ford Fulkerson algorithm, let us look at it again in a, in a slightly uh, similar structure but with a slightly different set of numbers. So this is a, a graph which has not ones but some 20s and 30s. So here intuitively the claim is that all 30 units can flow. But the 30 units cannot flow unlike the earlier case along the edges of the diamond because if I take 20 units up then I must split it as 10 plus 10. Right? So I must recognize that 10 must go down and 10 must go there. Similarly if I put 10 here then this 10 and the incoming 10 combine to form this 20. So this is how I get a flow of 30 in this graph. But if I start the Ford Fulkerson algorithm, it will try to saturate a path. So supposing it identifies the path S to D to E to T. Then if it identifies this path, then it has put a 20 flow through this edge. Okay? So we start by this flow, 
and we build the residual graph. The residual graph says that this 10 is 30 minus 20. Right? The residual capacity from D to E is now 10 because I had a capacity of 30 and I put 20 through. And the blue edge is now the residual edge which allows me to reduce this 20 back. Similarly from S to D I had earlier capacity of 20. I have put 20 through it so its reduced capacity is now 0 but I have a backward edge which allows me to undo this later if I want. And the same with E to T. E to T has reduced to 0 but I have a backward edge. Now I look for another path in this graph. So for instance I find that this path is there. right? I have a path from S to E to D to T. And in S to E to D to T my constraint is 10 right? because I have only 10 flowing out of uh, S to begin with. So I take that 10 and then I build a residual graph. So when I take that 10, these quantities here, okay, which are uh, associated with this edge, gets restored back by 10. Because the total flow from D to E was 20 in the first round, minus 10 in the second round is 10. Therefore, the residue is 30 minus 10, okay, equal to 20. Right? And everywhere else, now I have got 0 because I have saturated. Now if I look at S, there is no outgoing flow possible in this residual graph. So then I say that there are no more feasible paths and I stop and the residual edges or if I have been keeping track of the flows will tell me that I have achieved a flow of 30 in this graph. So again if we want to ask a question as to why a given flow is optimal, we can ask for some quantity which is a certificate of optimality. So if we go back to our original oil shipping thing, we claim that we could set up a flow of 7. Okay, so by hand we constructed a flow of 7. Now let's look at these three edges, the edge A to D, the edge B to D and the edge S to C. If we disconnect this graph by cutting these edges, rather if we cut these edges, we disconnect this graph. Okay? So these three edges form what is called a cut between S and T. Now in this cut, the total capacity is 4 plus 1 plus 2 is 7. Now if there is any flow at all, however it flows, it must cross from this side to this side, right? from the left to the right. So it can only flow from the left to the right through the edges with that part of the cut. But the cut can only support a flow of 7. So therefore, our optimum flow can definitely not sub ex ex uh, ex exceed 7 in this example, which we have already achieved. Right? So we know that we can do a flow of 7, but no more than 7 is possible because this cut will prevent anything more than 7 from flowing from the left to the right. So actually in this case this shows us that 7 is optimal. So in general you can look at various such cuts. So a cut is any set of edges which disconnects S from T and you can calculate the minimum cut across all of these. Right? And it is pretty clear that the maximum flow cannot exceed the minimum cut because it has to cross this cut. Right? So you have to go from one side to the other, it can only take that much capacity, so the flow cannot exceed that. So what is surprising is actually that it will always, in this, in this example of that we did, it was equal, but it is always going to be equal. Okay? So the max flow min cut theorem says that the max flow is actually always equal to the minimum cut. So here is one way to understand this. So if we look at our LP solution, right? when we achieve the maximum flow, then S is going to be disconnected from T. There is no further path. If I look at edge weight 0 and I remove those edges, then there is no further path. Right? So S is disconnected from T, so there is a cut. There are some edges which disconnect S from T. Now let's look at any edge in the residual graph at that point, which goes from the left hand side to the right hand side. Okay? So left is everything. So everywhere inside this, I do have paths with non-zero weights. Okay, and everywhere inside this, I do have paths to T with non-zero weights. So now, but I cannot get from the blue side to the green side. So that means that in the forward direction, all the edges must have saturated the capacity. Right? So every edge from L to R is actually at full capacity. What about an edge in my residual graph from F to R to L? The claim is that if there was some capacity here, then there would be a reverse edge which goes this way which would be at non-zero capacity. So there would be a path from S to T, but there are no paths. So this must be at zero. So all the reverse edges must be at zero, all the forward edges must be at full capacity. So this gives a, a not very precise, but a reason why the max flow will actually saturate this cut, but this could be any cut, right? So therefore the minimum cut in particular will be saturated. 
and therefore the max flow cannot exceed the minimum cut anyway. Right? So the max flow must achieve the minimum cut value. So one thing that one has to be careful about in the Ford Fulkerson algorithm is the choice of how to increase the path. So remember that in our pathological examples, we instead of going around the diamond, we go through the center. So supposing we keep doing that, then what will happen is that here after one iteration, we will go through the center and then we will reduce this to 99, this to 0, and this to 99 and we will set up a reverse edge of size 1. Then the next iteration, we will go in the reverse direction and we will again reduce this to 99, this to 99 and then we will set up this, reset this wedge back to 1 this way. So this way we can keep zigzagging. So I will go from 99 to 98 and then down I will go from 99 to 98. So it will take me 200 iterations in order to find this path that this flow has 200. On the other hand, it's pretty clear that I could have done it in two iterations if I had been cleverer, okay? Because I could have just said, oh, initially there is a path of 200 there and that saturates those two edges and there's another path of 200, uh, uh, there's a path of 100 there and a path of 100 here. So in two iterations, I can achieve 200. So it depends quite crucially on how I pick the path to augment. How do I take the feasible paths which still exist in the residual graph and choose which one to add to? So in general, we cannot say anything good and Ford Fulkerson is going to take time which is proportional to the capacity of the edges, which is not a great idea because although the edges may be large, you might be able to directly say, oh, this edge can take 100, the next edge can take 100. So in one shot, I can say the whole path can take 100. But if I have to do one at a time, then it becomes an extra parameter, not the actual size of the graph. But how do we do this feasible path business at, at all? Right? So every time we set up a residual graph, we have to find a path from S to T okay? and then augment it. So this we would have seen right at the beginning of this course, we will either do it through breadth first search or depth first search. Finding a path from one, set, one node to another node is typically uh, this, the exploration of the graph. If we use breadth first search, then what do we know? We find the shortest path in terms of number of edges. So one can prove that in this Ford Fulkerson algorithm, if you use breadth first search at every iteration to decide which path to augment, then you will be augmenting always the shortest path in terms of edges. So for instance, in this example here, if you had a choice between augmenting that path, the 100, the path which goes above like this and the path which goes like this, then breadth first search will say that the first, the red path has got two edges and the orange path has got three edges. So the red path is shorter. So you must augment that first. Okay? So if we use breadth first search in the Ford Fulkerson algorithm, it turns out that you will always get something which is proportional to the product of the vertices and the edges. So it will be polynomial in the size of the network independent of the capacities. 